we've been in this sermon series looking at what it means to be kingdom people. And we've been using the words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount to look at this, um, what, it, what it means for us to be followers of Christ and people in the kingdom of God. Um, so we've heard about the Beatitudes and about being salt and light and a few other things. And this morning, we're going to look at one passage that seems really simple, but is kind of maddeningly difficult. Um, and that is the one about loving your enemies. Um, one of you said to me this morning, ooh, love your enemies. I don't think I want to stay for that one. And I said, I don't know that I like it either. But it's in the Bible, so we're going to talk about it. So this is from um, Matthew 5, verse 43 to 48. Matthew 5, 43 to 48. If you have the Bible or an iPad or iPhone or something to find it, um, this is what it says. It says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy." But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. How's that for an enemy to a commandment? Be perfect as your Father is perfect. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. And thank you even for sort of the hard words, like this morning. Um, we ask that you teach us from your word this morning. Teach us more about who you are and who we are as your people. So we can serve you better. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm, I'm not going to look at every single one this morning, but this passage this morning is part of kind of a group of passages in the Sermon on the Mount that all start with, you've heard it said, yada, 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 but I tell you this. And what's happening is Jesus is kind of taking some of the traditional Old Testament laws and, and spinning them a little bit, or giving them a little bit more nuance, or kind of reinterpreting them in the way that they were meant to be interpreted in the first place. It seems like the leaders of the time and the believers of the time had just gotten it a little bit wrong, and Jesus is taking a second to say, this is what you usually think, but here's what I really want you to do. This is what I meant when I handed you these rules and these guidelines and these commandments in the first place. So if you look, if you have your Bible open and look around some of the other ones, you see a lot of things about, you know, you've heard it was said to people long ago, don't break your oath, but fulfill the Lord. But I tell you, don't swear an oath at all, or all these kinds of things. There's... There's lots of different passages that start with this. I've, you've heard it said that, <coughs> something, but now I tell you this. So this is part of what Jesus is doing on the Sermon on the Mount. He's saying this is the traditional way we've talked about these things. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you to love your enemies and pray for them. This new way of living. Jesus is giving his disciples and his, and his followers, his believers, both then and now for us, a new way of living into the world that God has created, living into the life that he has for us as his followers. Now, there are a couple of things that I want to draw out of this passage this morning. One is kind of really specific to this passage, and one is kind of about the Sermon on the Mount as a whole that I think is highlighted here. Um, so we'll start with that one first, that kind of all-encompassing thing first. So you may have noticed in verse 44 and 45 it says, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you might be children of your Father in heaven. Now, that kind of sounds, at first glance, like an if-then sort of statement, right? If you love your enemies, then you can be a child of God. If you do this thing, then you're qualified to be a child of God. It sounds like kind of a conditional statement, right? And if we don't meet the condition, then we're not qualified to be God's child. And one of the things that people often say sort of against the Sermon on the Mount, one of the critiques that it gets from different scholars or theologians or believers, maybe some of you are in this room, but one of the critiques that it often gets is that it sort of seems to take away from grace. You know, here are all of these things that Jesus tells us to do and to be that feel like conditions for entering into the kingdom of God. They feel like things we have to check off before we can be God's children. And we read sentences like that, love your enemy so that you may be a child of your Father in heaven. That feels like a condition, and we have to ask, but what about grace? What about salvation being a free gift? What about God loving us even when we don't measure up? What about grace? And I think, 
I think that Jesus isn't giving a condition here. I think that I think that the two they're they're not really exclusive of each other like they might seem. I think that what Jesus is saying is he's he's giving us a way to show the evidence that we are a child of God already. And John and Chris both kind of hinted at this in the last couple of weeks when we talked about the Beatitudes and being salt and light. These are things that we are because we are God's children. Not so that we can become God's children, but to, because we are God's children. Another way to, um, to translate what it's saying in our passage this morning is love your enemies and so prove that you are a child of the Father who is in heaven. So it's not a condition. It's not if an if-then statement. If you do this, then you are God's child. It's saying, if you are God's child, then the Holy Spirit is working in you and through you so that you are already the kind of person who can love even your enemies. Yeah, you are the kind of person who loves not just those who are who are good to you, those who love you, those who are kind to you, those who are kind of in your camp, but so that you can be the kind of person who loves even your enemies. That's the power of the Spirit within us. This isn't something that we can naturally do. This isn't kind of our base, normal nature, to be the kind of people who can even love our enemies and those who have hurt us, those who persecute us. But through the power of the Spirit and Him working in us and through us, He creates in us a new being that can do that. He gives us a new way of living so that we can do that. In the same way when we talked about the the Beatitudes, we are not natural peacemakers, and we are not naturally meek and pure in heart. But God works in us and helps us to become those things so we can be more like him. We're not naturally the salts of the earth and the light of the world. But because we are God's people, he works in us so that we can be that way. Because it's not how we naturally are. I think I've been more and more convinced of that fact as I've become a parent. (laughs) Now, I, I love my daughter. She is very cute and snuggly and sweet and great. And as we leave the cute little baby stage and enter into the toddler stage, sometimes it feels like I'm getting a little mini kind of microcosm of what it is to be, what our human nature really is. You know, you watch a toddler, and toddlers are kind of selfish. I said it. <laughs> toddlers, toddlers are kind of selfish. You know, it's, um, for a little toddler, the whole world is about them and what they want to do and what they can do and what they wish they can do and what you're not letting them do and all of those kinds of things. And it's all about them. You know, the, the other night, Nora, my daughter, is teething right now, finally. Um, and so the other night, she was up maybe four times throughout the night, which meant I was up about four times throughout the night trying to get her back to sleep. And the next morning, she was up and ready to play, and I was exhausted. And I didn't want to read the same books over and over. I just wanted to lay on the couch and watch TV for a while. But she didn't have a whole lot of empathy for me. She, she didn't look at me and say, oh, poor mommy is so tired. I'll just sit by myself for a while. She, she wanted to play, and it was about what she wanted to do. And we kind of laugh and say, yeah, she's, you know, she's one year old. This is, that's how it should be. But if you think about it, if I were to act that way towards someone, that would be a really selfish thing to do, right? If I were the reason that I kept, you know, if I kept calling you over and over throughout the night, and then the next day I had, we had to go for a hike, and I was going to make you hang out with me and do all these really active things, that would be a very selfish way for me to act. Because, you know, that's, um, toddlers are just kind of selfish people. And I think deep down in our base human nature, we are all sort of selfish toddlers, right? We want to be just for ourselves. We want to do what we want to do. And we want to focus on what we can do and what we wish we could do and what someone else isn't letting us do. But that's not how God calls us to live. And that's not how God allows us to live. That's not how God works in us as we live and follow him. Instead, God changes us so that instead of being little selfish toddlers that maybe we are at our base nature, we can love even our neighbors. We can be meek and we can be pure of heart and we can be salt and light to the world because of the power of the Spirit working in us. I think that the the whole Sermon on the Mount and this passage, maybe especially, um, is a showcase of what God can do if we let him work in our lives. It's a showcase of the incredible transformation 
that the Spirit can work in us, that God can work in us when we decide to follow Him and when we allow Him into our lives and our hearts. It changes us so that instead of being the selfish toddler that maybe we want to be, we can be the kind of person that even loves our enemies, even loves those who hurt us and persecute us. So that's, that's the first thing I want to draw out of this passage, that this is about an incredible transformation. This isn't something that we can do on our own, but it's something that God gives us the power to do, even in spite of the things maybe we want or are naturally inclined to do. So the second thing I want to, I want to point out about this is that Jesus here is kind of playing with the golden rule. You know, we've all kind of heard the golden rule. It comes out of Leviticus, and it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So when Jesus is telling his disciples and the listeners that they're there on the morning of the um, Sermon on the Mount, um, he's playing with the golden rule. And he says, You've heard that it was said, Love your enemy, but hate your, or love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. And he's going back to that golden rule. So apparently the leaders of the time had kind of turned the golden rule into a dichotomy. So instead of love the Lord your God and love your neighbor, it turned into love your neighbor, but you can hate your enemy. Your neighbor is a specific thing, right? Love your neighbor, but that means you can hate those who aren't your neighbors. Hate your enemies, and that's okay. And what Jesus is saying, no, you need to love your neighbor even if your neighbor is your enemy. There's that little tweak, little nuance on how we had come to understand that golden rule from Leviticus. Love your enemy and pray for them. Love your neighbor even if he is your enemy. Now, Jesus, um, in another passage, told a story to get at the same idea, and it's one that I know that you've heard before, and we've talked about it here before, and that's the parable of the Good Samaritan. I won't read it all to you, I'll just kind of paraphrase it, and probably some of you could paraphrase it right along with me, but the story goes, there was a man who was robbed and beaten and left on the side of the road, and he was just kind of stuck there. He couldn't help himself. He needed someone to come and help him. So three times, different leaders, religious leaders, priests, Pharisees, Levites came, and they passed right by him and kind of looked at him with disgust. They didn't want to help him. They didn't want to get involved in this man who was left on the side of the road. And finally, a Samaritan came. And the Samaritan got him on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and cared for him and made sure he got well and took him under his wing. And what was so significant about this story at the time was that Samaritans were seen as kind of the, the outcasts of the time. They were people that they didn't want to be seen with. They were those people that they didn't want to see be seen in relationship with because it would destroy their own reputation. They were enemies of sorts. You know, they were they were the lower caste. They were they were people who just weren't worthy of being dignified with your presence. And that was the person that was shown to be the neighbor of this man who was left on the side of the road. The answer wasn't what they wanted. When the religious leaders asked Jesus, who is my neighbor, and Jesus gave them the story of the Good Samaritan, that wasn't the answer they were hoping for. They were hoping for a list of neighborly attributes or of maybe a list of people who they didn't have to love. You know, be specific about who my neighbor is so I can decide who isn't my neighbor and not waste my time loving them. That's the kind of thing they were hoping for. But Jesus says, no, your neighbor is anyone and everyone you come in contact with. Your neighbor is anyone who's in your sphere of influence, anyone who you have the chance to love and show what it means to be a follower of Christ. That is your neighbor, even if maybe they look like your enemy at first. Your neighbor is anyone, and you need to love your neighbor, even if that neighbor is your enemy. So, as you know, the religious leaders asked, who is my neighbor? So, another question you might ask is, who is my enemy? And Jesus answers in our passage this morning from Matthew, our enemy is those who persecute us. Anyone who actively sort of thwarts you in a way. And that can be in very big, dramatic ways like we hear about in the news, or maybe more smaller, everyday ways, like probably it's more of us... Um, experience on a day to time. You know, we hear about ISIS, and we hear about ways that Christians around the world are being persecuted and physically harmed and in danger of their lives. Those, those are enemies 
to those Christians there. And I don't know about you, I've never experienced anything like that, but I have experienced persecution on a lower scale in my own life. I've experienced um, people working against me, people um, not wanting me around or not wanting me to be there. Those are enemies, right? You can all relate to that on some level. And the other answer that Jesus gives, who is our enemy, is those who doesn't, those who don't love you, those who are not your own people. You know, it says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? So you can kind of infer from that that your enemy might be someone who doesn't love you, right? If you're only loving to those who love you, um, we need to love those who don't also love us. Those are our enemies. So that um, the next question that begs to be asked then is, if those are our enemies, if our enemies are people who seek to thwart us or who don't love us, what does it mean for us to love them? And I love that Jesus gives us three really practical, pretty simple ways to actually love our enemies in this passage. First of all, um, Jesus says loving your enemies is as simple as greeting them. It's so simple and yet so profound just to greet somebody. Um, you know, Jesus says if you... If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even your pagans, don't even pagans do that? Greet your enemies. I, I remember I was when I was a freshman in college, I went um, what they call going potluck to get your college roommates, which means that we, I filled out kind of a survey and my school matched me with someone who they thought would be a good fit for a roommate, and man, they were wrong for me. <laughs> um, they, we had the similar taste in music and similar sleeping habits, but that was about it. And as you know, as the year went on, um, this roommate just wouldn't even greet me anymore. You know, I would walk in the room and I'd say hi, and she just would look at me and not even answer. Um, and it felt by the end of the year, I just felt so devalued and kind of dehumanized by this roommate of mine because she wouldn't even give me the dignity of greeting me. And it felt like such a slap in the face. Greeting someone is such an easy, small thing to do, but it makes such an impact. To actually stop and just say hi to someone or give them a smile or a handshake kind of recognizes their humanity and recognizes their worth. It says you're worth stopping and saying hi to. And to not even greet someone can feel like such a slap in the face like that my college roommate did to me. So greeting them, Jesus says, is one way that we can love our enemies. Another way that Jesus says that we can love our enemies is to meet their practical needs. Um, it says in our passage that God sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous together at the same time. God sends rain so that crops can grow and that the world can flourish, whether we're enemies of God or friends of God. So that's another way that we can love our enemies, too. Find ways to meet a practical need. And that can be as easy as something as, you know, handing them a cup of coffee when they walk into the office or um, finding, you know, picking up a pencil if they drop it. Finding little ways, again, to recognize the worth of that person, even if you don't like them, even if they work, you know, kind of seek to thwart you. Um, finding ways to love them in those little ways can make such a profound impact. Um, and third, Jesus says that we can love our enemies by praying for them. That's what he starts off saying, right? I tell you, love your enemies and pray for them. Something we can do in private, something we don't even have to interact with them and kind of save ourselves from, from the enemy actions of these people who might be our enemies. But we can pray for them and ask God to work in their lives and in their hearts and give them healing where they need healing, <coughs> new understanding or they need understanding. That can be an incredibly powerful way to love our enemies. Now, one, one thing that I want to be sure to say is that loving our enemies doesn't necessarily mean hanging out with them all the time. Sometimes our enemies are enemies for a reason. Sometimes people really deeply us, <coughs> and it's not healthy, and it's not safe to be with that person anymore. Sometimes people are actually physically dangerous to us, or they're emotionally dangerous to us, or spiritually dangerous to us, and that's why they might be our enemies. So sometimes, I don't, I don't think that God is calling us to be best friends with our enemies. There's kind of a cliche, I don't know, mom and grandma line that you have to love everybody, but you don't have to like them. <laughs> and I think that's really true. God calls us to love our enemies, but we don't have to like them and hang out with them all the time. Because sometimes we need to you know, have some self-preservation in those ways, too. Um, 
So hanging out with them doesn't, you know, or loving them doesn't mean hanging out with them all the time. But really, if we're called to give our enemies dignity, to greet them, to help meet their needs when we can, and to pray for them, these little things that recognize their worth in small ways, I think that changes us, even maybe more than it changes them. You know, if we recognize our enemy as someone who's worth stopping and saying hello to, someone who's worth um, praying for, taking time out of our day and our spiritual lives to pray for this person or to meet a practical need, it changes the way that we see them. You know, if my freshman year roommate had stopped and actually said hi to me and had a different conversation, we may have had a little bit better relationship than where we ended up that year of college. But it changes our, it changes our perceptions and changes our hearts when we're willing to stop and love our enemies, when we're willing to let God work through us so that we can love our enemies. It changes us. It's it's a call to approach everyone with grace, just as Christ approaches us. It's a call to to recognize that everyone has worth on some level, even if it's hard for us to see it in the way that they've treated us, or in the way that they treat others, or in the way that they act or talk, whatever it is that gets under our skin, they're still a child of God. And God calls us to see them with grace, just as God sees us with grace. Another way to put it is that the command to love your enemy is a command to set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are here on earth. The command to love your enemy is a command to find your hope and your satisfaction in God and how God sees you and not in how others treat you. The steadfast love of the Lord Psalm 63 says, is better than life. And I think that is the call that we're we're called to recognize here in this passage of loving your enemies. God God loves us, and God loves others, and wants us to see them with grace. That's what he calls us to this morning. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this word, and we ask that you give us the the boldness and the power to to follow through with it in our lives. Um, It's a difficult thing to love those who hurt us or who actively seek to thwart us, but we know that through you, you are making us a new creation so that we can be the kind of people who even love our enemies. And we pray. Amen.